بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم لا حول ولا قوة إلا بالله العلي العظيم الحمد لله رب العالمين صلى الله على سيدنا ونبينا أبي القاسم المصطفى محمد وعلى آله الطيبين الطاهرين لا سيما بقية الله في الأرضين أجل الله تعالى فرجه الشريف وجعلنا من أعوان وأنصار إن شاء الله In our series on contemporary issues in Islamic thought, we have covered already the issue of feminism, pluralism, and secularism. Inshallah, in this session and the next session, I am going to talk about the relationship between us as followers of Islam and the people from other faith or the people from our own faith but from different uh, schools of Islam. <coughs> In other words, we are going to talk about interreligious and intra-religious relations. And of course, part of it is dialogue. So this session and next session, inshallah, will be devoted to this topic. Of course, it's a very broad area, and I had always uh, hoped that maybe we could have a series of lectures on dialogue so that we can uh, address different theoretical and practical aspects of dialogue. Maybe, inshallah, in the future, uh, Allah gives us this tawfiq. Assalamu alaikum. First of all, we should know that according to the Quran and according to the Sunnah of the Prophet وسلم, we are in need of relation with other people. We shouldn't think that either people belong to our camp or they are our enemies and we should fight them. No, we are in need of establishing good relations with people who have this readiness and this openness to us for rela good relation. And I will mention some of the practical examples in the life of the Prophet and Imams along with some uh, verses of the Quran. And then hopefully uh, to the second half of the lecture, I will focus on uh, interreligious dialogue. But I need to give you first some uh, ground and some underlying factors. The Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam during his life whether when he was a prophet or before that, is always to be taken as a role model. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala asks us to refer to the prophet as our role model. لَقَدْ كَانَ لَكُمْ فِي رَسُولِ اللَّهِ أُسْوَةٌ حَسَنًا If we study carefully the life of the prophet and his conduct, we realize that the prophet was always giving priority to making friendship and warm response to the people who are ready to be friends, not enemies. He was always encouraging also Muslims to have good relations with uh, themselves and with others. Sometimes we think that even maybe if there was not a real and a very good reason, even sometimes some excuses were uh, searched for so that some kind of mercy, some kind of uh, warmness could be shown to the people. For example, if someone was a child of a good person, Maybe even he himself or she herself was not a very special person. 
Uh, still, the prophet was showing very uh, kind, uh, kind uh, reaction to that person. For example, you may have heard about the a story of the uh, Prophet Sallallahu when he was uh, meeting a group of the captives after a battle. And among the captives were uh, some people who belonged to the family of Hatam Ta'i. You know Hatam Ta'i. Hatam Ta'i was a very generous person. He lived before Islam actually came, and he died before Islam came. But he was very uh, generous person, very kind to the people, very much uh, helping others. When the tribe of Tai was defeated by Amir al Mu'minin in a battle that they had. So the captives were brought to the Prophet, and one of them was the daughter of Hatam Ta'i. She was called Safana. When she saw the Prophet, she stood up and said, Oh Muhammad, my father has died, has passed away, and my brother has disappeared. If you find acceptable, please release me. And do not let our enemies among Arabs to be happy and feel happy that I am now a captive. Because apparently they had themselves, you know, some maybe enemies, some rival, some competitors. So she said, you know, if my enemies and my your competitors know that I am captive, so they will be very happy. So don't let them to be happy. And then she uh, started talking about some of the merits of her father. The Prophet وسلم, didn't say, this is useless, you know, your father was kafir, and even if your father had some merits, it has nothing to do with you. No. Quite opposite. The Prophet said, release and free this woman. Because her father had good character. And then the Prophet also said, because of her, release all the captive. So this is the way that the Prophet وسلم, was honoring and appreciating any kind of invitation for friendship, any kind of invitation for having good relation. Whenever there was a battle, something which was unavoidable, among the advices that the Prophet was giving to his companions was to ask them to be very much careful about their behavior and to act with very clear sense of responsibility and seeking the pleasure of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. For example, we have, alhamdulillah, this, many of these sermons of the Prophet, alhamdulillah, are available. One of the sermons belonged to the Battle of Badr. Just before the battle started, the Prophet told his companions, وَإِنَّكُمْ قَدْ أَصْبَحْتُمْ بِمَنْزِلٍ مِنْ مَنَازِلِ الْحَقِّ لَا يَقْبَلُ اللَّهُ فِيهِ مِنْ أَحَدٍ إِلَّا مَبْتُغِيَ بِهِ وَجْهُهُ the Prophet told his companions that now you are in a very important situation, a very important station, and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will not accept from anyone except what has been done seeking his pleasure, seeking his face. And then the Prophet asked his people to be patient. 
فی مواطن البعث مما یفرج الله به الحم و ینجی به من الغم the prophet asked them to be patient and said that being patient when there are difficulties when there are problems causes your problem to be solved and your grief and sadness be removed and by this you can achieve happiness in akhirah so you see instead of prophet asking his people to focus on military aspect of this engagement try to fight hard and severe and do not let any of them for example escape or so on the prophet is giving them a spiritual lesson the prophet says remember that you are in a very special situation and the only thing that allah will accept from you is what you do for his own sake and for his own face and you must be patient do not let your emotions take you away imam ali alayhi salam in a famous battle which he had you know the battle of safin he heard that some of his people the people from his army from his camp are shouting at the people in the army of Muawiyah and cursing them and swearing at them. And the Imam, when he heard this, he was very sad. According to some of the historians, like Nasr ibn Muzahim, who has a book called Waqat al Safin, it's about the advent of or the event of Safin. He says these two people were Amr ibn Hamq and Hujr ibn Adi who were sewering at people in the army of Muawiyah. Imam Ali told them, I don't like you to be sewering at people, cursing people. But instead of swearing at them saying bad things to them just describe what they have done what qualities they have had this would be much better for convincing the people who want to seek the truth and better for you and instead of all these pray Allahumma haqqin dema'ana wa dema'ahum. Oh Allah, please protect our blood and their blood. So even you pray for your enemy in the battle. Wa aslih zata baynana wa baynahum. Oh Allah, bring reconciliation between the two parties. Wahdihim min dhalalatihim hatta ya'rif al-haqqa man jahilah. Oh Allah, guide them so that the one who doesn't know the truth would be able to know the truth. And those who have gone astray will come back to the right path. So even in a battle, Imam salam is training his people to be first of all looking for reconciliation asking Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for reconciliation, for guidance, and for protection of both parties. So even if the prophet or imams were involved in some kind of military encounter, it was not out of hostility or anger or personal desire for victory. It was as something which was not avoidable and as the last resort, but still in a spirit of piety and benevolence. If you want this, you can find it in Nahjul Balagh, Sermon 179. Nahjul Balagh, according to Faisal Islam, because there are different uh, styles of ordering for the sermons and letters. So this is 179, according to 
the version which is compiled by Faisal Islam. Imam Sadiq alayhi salam was in a very important historical period because Imam alayhi salam lived in the time that Muslims were faced with many different ideas because of the expansion of the Islamic world. So Muslims were exposed to different cultures, different schools of thought, different philosophies, different religious traditions. So it was very important to be able to face this new uh, situation with wisdom and with clear understanding. So Imam alayhi salam used to prepare and train his students and also we find that Imam alayhi salam even was trying to uh, bring some kind of speciality. For example, uh, we have that Imam alayhi salam was very much trying to train Aban ibn Taghlib and Zurara, the son of Ayun, for fiqh. And these two were sitting in the mosque of Medina and involving in giving fatwas in fiqh. Not only for the Shia, for all Muslim community. Hamran ibn Ayyon was specialized in Quranic studies. Mu'min al-Taq, who was a companion of Imam, was specialized in Tawheed. Hisham ibn Hakam was specialized in a guide especially about imama and how to prove the uh, authority of Ahlul Bayt. So Imam was training his people, his companions, for this important task of discussion and dialogue with people in different fields. And even we have some reports that Imam Ali Salam was himself listening sometimes to them and then afterwards commenting that you discussed in this way and it was better to do this way or for example imam was encouraging them that you did very well try to you know uh, go forward with this uh, ability and with this art a very famous atheist person in that time who didn't have faith is ibn abil oja you may have heard his name ibn abil oja he was an atheist and one of the things that they used to do is they, were used, they used to sit as a circle just near Kaaba and trying to argue that God does not exist. And there was such a freedom, you know, that people could sit next to Kaaba and question the whole existence of God. Once one of the companions of Imam Sadiq, of course, you know that at that time, followers of Ahlul Bayt were not that much in control or you know, power, and were, they were very much marginalized. But uh, still, Ahlul Bayt had great respect and honor. So one of the companions of Imam Sadiq, salam, Mufazzal, who is very famous, once heard these people are trying to disprove the existence of God and questioning everything. So he went near and uh, started talking to them. And then when he heard their uh, strange ideas, he got angry. He became very emotional, very nervous. Then Ibn Abu al-Oja asked him, who are you? Who do, whom do you follow? He said, I am Mufazzal, and I am a follower of Ja'far ibn Muhammad. He said, this is surprising because we have Lots of discussions with Ja'far ibn Muhammad himself, but he has never said any bad thing to us. He always hears, this is exactly what he said, he always listens to us with patience to the extent that whatever we want to say, we say. And then when we think that he is convinced, then he refutes all our arguments. So then we cannot refute his arguments. If you are a follower of Ja'far ibn Muhammad, you must speak to us like him. 
And then you know that Mufazzal went to Imam Sadiq alayhi salam, and Imam Sadiq alayhi salam taught him Tawheed, which is now as an essay, famous essay, Tawheed al-Mufazzal. So Imam taught him Tawheed and how to be able to prove the existence of God so that when he meets the people who don't accept, to be able to discuss with them in a rational way, not to just get nervous and angry and shout. This doesn't solve the problem. This just makes them feel that they are in the right position. I have selected here some very important hadith, which I hope you can make note of them. These are very important hadith about the importance of making good relation with the people, speaking kind words to the people. Don't cause unnecessary conflict. Don't cause unnecessary enmity. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, Astana' al khair ila man huwa ahluhu wa ila man huwa ghayru ahlihi. Act properly with benevolence to the people who deserve and the people who do not deserve. So don't make condition. Say, I am going to be kind and speaking politely only to the people who deserve. No, the Prophet said to the people who deserve and the people who don't deserve. Why? Because if that person doesn't deserve this, you deserve to treat him in this way. So don't say that person doesn't deserve my politeness. You deserve to speak politely. It's a very important concept. I deserve to treat people with kindness with respect, saying good words. If I swear at someone or insult someone, I shouldn't think that I am only damaging that person. I am first of all damaging myself. And I don't deserve to be damaging myself. Imam Sadiq alayhi salam says, Ya Ishaq, Ishaq was the person who was addressed by Imam. Sani'i al-munafiq bil-lisanik wa akhlis wuddaka lil-mu'min. If you meet a hypocrite, Imam said with your tongue, means with your speech, with your words, try to establish good relation with him. Try to control him, try to handle him. But have your pure love for mu'min. So you don't need to, uh, to love a hypocrite, but still you can make good relation with a hypocrite. Not by not causing necessary emotional conflict. Because sometimes this is you know, part of human nature. If someone totally disagrees with you, but you are kind to him, he will not become your enemy. So there are hypocrites. You don't accept their ideas. But don't try to make them your explicit and your frank enemies by saying that I know you are hypocrite, and then swearing at them. There is no need for that. If they say we are with you, Okay, formally accept this. Of course, in your heart, you, so, you know that this person is hypocrite, but you don't need to say, because if you say that I know you are hypocrite, you know, and you don't believe in me, you don't accept me, then he becomes your clear enemy. 
امام صادق علیه السلام علیه السلام فَإِنْ جَالَسَكَ يَهُودِيُونَ فَأَحْسَنْ مُجَالَسَكَ If a person from another face, even if a person from non-Islamic face, a Jewish person is your companion, be a good companion for your friend. There is a hadith from Imam Ali alayhi salam. This is in his will to Muhammad ibn Hanafiyya. You know Muhammad ibn Hanafiyya. He was one of the sons of Imam Ali alayhi salam, but not from the lady. وَأَحْزَنْ إِلَىٰ جَمِيعِ النَّاسِ كَمَا تُحِبُّ أَنْ يُحْسَنَ إِلَيْكِ وَرْضِ لَهُمْ مَا تَرْضَاهُ لِنَفْسِكِ وَاسْتَقْبِحْ لَهُمْ مَا تَسْتَقْبِحُهُ مِنْ غَيْرِكِ Be kind to the people in the same way that you like people to be kind to you. Be happy with anything for the people that you are happy for yourself. If you are happy, if you are satisfied with something for yourself, then you can be happy this to happen to other people. But if you don't like something for yourself, don't like this for the other as well. And then Imam said to Muhammad ibn Anafiya to his son, make your morality, your treatment, your conduct with the people in the way that if you are absent, they look for you, they miss you. And if you die, they cry for you. It's not only about Muslims, even with non-Muslims. If you have, for example, some non-Muslim neighbors or you know some colleagues in the office, we must treat them in the way that if we are not there, they miss us. Of course, sometimes some, you find some people that they have their own problems and they can never come you know, to good terms with uh, a good person. But these are exceptions. It's not that always people are like this. Normally, people are very much uh, soft and they love, you know, a person who is showing uh, politeness and kindness. In another hadith, Imam Ali alayhi salam mentions different groups of people that you should visit them. You should visit them. Go and see them. The ninth category, Imam mentions ten, categ ten categories. The ninth category of the people that you should visit. Atase abwabul aada. Alladhi yaskun bil mudarat qawailuhum. The ninth group are the enemies that by visiting them, they become cool. Their enmity goes away. And Imam alayhi salam says that by being soft to them, by showing kindness to them, by visiting them, their hostility will be extinguished. Sometimes, you know, we see that unfortunately we are so much... Uh, closed and close-minded, that even we don't visit our relatives. Sometimes people don't visit, you know, for example, their in-laws or, you know, with the parents or children or, you know, cousins. They feel that, you know, they have not been kind to us. And Imam Ali says that you must even visit your enemies. If you see that by visiting them, they can become better and they can become soft. And most of the time, it gives good you know, response. Because human beings love, you know, respect, love, you know, attention. And you know that one of the places in which we 
uh, spend zakat. According to the Quran, you know, zakat must be distributed in different occasions, different uh, places. One of them is for al-mu'allafati qulubuhum. The people who are given zakat so that their hearts become good with Muslims, with mu believers. Al-mu'allafati qulubuhum. So the Prophet used to give zakat even to kuffar so that these kuffar feel that Muslims are not their enemies. And this is a discussion in our fiqh about sadaqah. If you are going to pay sadaqah, should you pay just to the Shia or only to the Muslims? Imam Khomeini in his Tahrir al Wasile, in the section about Sadaqah, he says the condition for the person who receives Sadaqah is not to be Muslim or Shia. You can give it even to a non Shia or to a non Muslim who has good relation with Muslims, who is not fighting, who is not in war with Muslim. And there is a hadith which says, Tasaddaqu ala ahl al kullaha. Give your donations, your charity, to the people of all different religions. Of course, we should give always priority to the people that are closer to us. For example, if in your family, there is a poor person. This is great responsibility of you to look after their financial you know, problems. If I have someone, for example, if my cousin or my you know, aunt or uncle is poor, I have to first to sort out that because this is the way it works. If everyone starts with the people who he knows or she knows personally, then everything will be sorted out. So as long as we have people who are our relatives and they are poor, so we should give them first. Then the people close to us in our community, we should look after them. Because if we don't look after them, the others will not look after them. But technically, there is no, no problem in giving sadaqah to them as an act of worship. So it will be considered as an act of worship. You will be rewarded for this. Even for waqf, you know waqf, waqf means to dedicate something. Pardon? Or trust. Means. Yeah, but trust is a very general concept. So in Islamic law, you may, for example, Suppose, for example, you have a house. You can mention a special, you know, formula and then dedicate this for a specific purposes or to a specific group of people or even for the public. For example, you go to Mashhad and buy a house and dedicate this and say these are for the people who visit Imam Reza from all over the world. Or no, you say, these are for the people who come from my town and they don't have any place. I want to dedicate this to them. This is called waqf. So this is not something that anyone can alter, you know. So your children cannot say, okay, this is now our mother or father has passed away. We want to sell the house. No. This is dedicated and they cannot alter this. So is it possible to do some waqf for Non-Muslims, Imam Khomeini in Tahrir al-Wasile, in Kitab al-Waqf, problem 38, Mas'ale 38, problem of number 38. He says that it seems that it's okay to dedicate Waqf to non-Muslims, especially if they are your relatives. If you have a non-Muslim relative, 
and you are worried about them. So you may do your waqf for them. You say, this house is dedicated to my, for example, cousins who don't have you know, money, fi they are punishment, generations by generation. So that will be okay. Thus, they should not be mm, the people who are, from a legal point of view, co considered as enemies or as, for example, the people who have opposed Islam. But if they are just non-Muslim, no problem. The final thing that I want to mention is from Imam Sadiq alayhi salam. Then I go to interreligious dialogue. This hadith is mentioned in different versions, but very similar. And I don't know if you have had this experience of dialogue with non-Muslims or relation with non-Muslims or with people that you don't agree with them. And sometimes you feel that you have achieved some good results, but then you uh, start wondering, maybe I have betrayed my faith. You think that maybe I should have been more clear and more frank, and just because I didn't tell them all the things, I could establish good relations. If I had told them all the things, maybe I could. Sometimes you know, this comes to your mind if you have some kind of engagement. But Imam Sadiq salam tells us that indeed this is a requirement of faith. That you don't tell people all the things that you believe. If there are people that don't agree with you on certain issues, you don't discuss with them those issues and make them fight you or become your enemy or just disagree with you. For example, in Islamic, let me talk about Islamic situation. We, the Shia, have some ideas, and we are very convinced about our ideas, and we are also ready to discuss about our ideas. We don't have any uh, reluctance. But is it necessary that as soon as I see a Sunni Muslim brother or sister, I start talking about all those differences and make them mad? There is no need for that. Yes, if there is someone who is educated, who wants to know the truth and is open to me, I can discuss with him. But I don't need to tell him in the beginning, look, I believe these things that you don't believe. This is not acceptable. Or if I meet with a Christian friend, I don't need to tell him in advance that Trinity is wrong. You don't believe in, for example, incarnation or whatsoever. Just let us start with the things that we agree, with the things which are common. Imam Sadiq alayhi salam says, Rahimallahu abdan estajarra mawaddatan nas ila nafsihi wa ilayna bi an yudhhira lahum ma ya'rifun May Allah's mercy be upon that servant, the servant of Allah, who tries to attract the love of people for himself and for us by showing them what they like and keeping away from them or hiding from them what they don't like. In another version, it's very similar. The beginning is very similar, but Imam says, tell them what they like and hide from them what they don't like. This is very important. Unfortunately, some of our people 
not only they don't have this policy, they do quite opposite. They just tell what they don't like, and they don't tell <laughs> what they like. So if you, for example, go to some of the Shia websites or Shia gatherings or meetings, you find that most of the time they stress on something that no one other than the Shia accept. Okay, as I said, we are proud of our faith, but this is not what Imam Sadiq expects from us. Imam Sadiq expects from us to bring respect and love of the other communities to the Shia community, to increase this love. And a very wise and rational way is to tell the people about our commonalities. And then people very much appreciate what we say because we have lots of beautiful things in those areas that we share that they can benefit and they can appreciate. Okay. Now let us talk a little bit about interreligious dialogue. As I said, we will have two sessions on this topic. When I'm saying interreligious dialogue, so it means dialogue with the people of other faith. What about dialogue with the people who have no faith? Of course, even with them, we can have good relation. Even with them, we can find some common grounds. Sometimes people may have no faith, but uh, still, we can have dialogue about moral point of view. We can have dialogue about our common concerns, like about environment. For example, if there is an mm, environment uh, meeting or conference, we can very much in get engaged, even with the people who have no faith, on how to look after our world, our globe, how to look after our environment. So. I don't want to dismiss and to exclude any group of people from dialogue. But of course, for us, our very natural uh, choice of dialogue is with the people of other book. This is very natural and very uh, easy choice for us to get involved with the people who believe in God the Almighty, who believe in the need for revelation, and who believe in the fact that we human beings are accountable for what we do and we will be resurrected and there would be eternal life for us. And these are the Jews, these are the Christians. Maybe there are other groups of people. Some people believe that even Hindus in the beginning, uh, they had a prophet and according to some hadiths, they had a book and they had a prophet. But there are now changes, but even Hinduism may have original uh, divine aspect. Maybe other you know, religions, we don't know. As we said in the beginning, you know, uh, in the, I think it was the second session when we talked about pluralism, we said that we know that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has sent prophets to all corners of the world, to all nations. So maybe these people have also some original uh, divine you know, aspect. In any case, for us, our very natural partners of dialogue are the people of the book, the people who believe in God, the people who believe in human accountability before God. And this is very important because if you just take into account the number or the population of Muslims and Christians, it makes more than half population of the whole world. Because Muslims are about 1.5 billion. Christians are about 2 billion. So Muslims and Christians together constitute more than half population of the world. So the dialogue between Islam and Christianity is very important and very crucial. And I think this dialogue very much f affects the whole future of the humanity. 
And this is not surprising if we read in Islamic hadith that when Imam Mahdi salam come, he would be accompanied by Jesus. Why among all the prophets, Jesus comes? This shows that Muslims and Christians have lots of things to do together, inshallah. And we hope we can prepare for that. So dialogue with the Christian world is very important. I have a paper which is published in the book Catholic Shia in Dialogue. The paper is called Mary, Jesus, and Christianity, a Muslim perspective. In that paper, I have mentioned different reasons for dialogue with the Christians. The reasons that make me happy to get involved in genuine and fertile dialogue with the Christians. Please say salawat. Very quickly, I read for you these reasons. First, we both believe in and worship the same God, who is the one, the merciful, the benevolent, the omnipotent, the omniscient, and the omnipresent. This is very important. Sometimes, unfortunately, we underestimate the fact that someone like you believes in the same God. Just to appreciate that, you need to think someone who doesn't believe in God. If someone doesn't believe in God, even if he's, you know, your very close relative, you find, you know, a big problem in understanding each other. Because God is such important, you know, reference point. If someone doesn't believe in God, so you don't know what to expect from that person. What are the principles that that person is going to observe? At any time, he may change his tactics and his principles. Because if a person himself becomes God, then he will do at every circumstance what he likes. So we must appreciate this fact that we believe in the same God. Who is the one? You may say that Christians believe in Trinity, but uh, still they believe in one God. And this is part of the Abrahamic tradition that they all believe in one God and they are considered and classified as monotheistic religions. But their understanding of one God is Trinitarian. But they believe that God is the one. God the creator is the one. But he has, uh, you know, incarnated in, for example, Jesus. And, and I find it very unwise that sometimes Christians and sometimes Muslims try to say that our God is different from your God. Sometimes Muslims say this, sometimes Christians say this. God is the same God. Why we try to impose our own differences on God and say that God must also be different. God is the same God. And language or, you know, culture must not make God different. Allah is God. God is Allah. In every language, they may have different words. If you read Arabic Bible, in Arabic Bible, they use Allah. They don't use any other word. And I myself, normally when I write in English, I use God. So that my English you know, readers feel comfortable. I don't need to always say Allah, Allah, to make them you know, feel strained. Of course, all the languages may not have the same accuracy. All the terms may not be equally you know, important. But uh, still, they refer to the same thing, to the same one, to the same person. So God is the same. Muslims and Christians immensely love God and try to devote themselves to him and approximate to him. For example, we read in the Psalms, uh, chapter 42, verse 2, 
My soul thirsts for God, the God of life. When shall I go to seek the face of God? Vajhullah, face of God. The Vajhullah, this is what we have in Islam. And in the Quran, to God belong the east and the west. Whenever you turn, there is the face of God. Aynama tuwallu, fathamna vajhullah. And as you know, there is a rich literature in both Christianity and Islam on spirituality and how to become close to God. Second, we both believe in human free will and his responsibility and accountability before God. This is very important that we believe that we are responsible and accountable. This is something which is unfortunately missing in the modern you know, culture. In the modern culture, they always ask about their rights. What is my right? Where is my right? Before asking, what is my responsibility? They always ask, what is my right? But right and responsibility must come together. I must know first what I am going to offer, and second, what I am going to receive. I cannot only expect people or the world or everyone gives me. We share also the same understanding of basic major moral values. I'm not saying our moral system is completely the same, but I'm saying basic major moral values are the same. For example, if honesty is good, it's good for all of us. If love is good, is kindness is good, is helping others is good, if keeping promises is good, if looking after the weak people, the elders, the children is good, it's good for all of us. You don't find disagreements in basic values. Third, we both believe in resurrection and God's treatment of human beings with justice and mercy on the day of judgment. We both have high esteem of the gift of reason and conscience and at the same time recognize our need for divine revelation in our path towards happiness in this world and hereafter. So at the same time that we accept human reason, we say that we need revelation. Of course, you know that our Christian friends have not the same understanding of the role of reason. Some of them are not very much in favor of reason because they feel that human reason has suffered as a result of original sin. But some like Catholics, they are more in favor of reason. But uh, still, I think Islam, especially Shia Islam, is much more in favor of human reason. But it makes no difference. Both of us appreciate reason. And at the same time, we say we are in need of guidance from God. We don't say that we are self-sufficient. We don't need any guidance from God. Number five. We both believe that all humans come from the same father and mother. And that is Adam and Eve. This is very important, not only theoretically, also emotionally. So when I meet my Christian friends, I should know that our grand-grand-grandfather is the same. So we are all cousins. So emotionally, it's very important to know that we come from the same father and mother. We have a great sense of fellowship and deny any sort of racism. We believe in dignity of man and reject any unjust treatment of mankind. We also appreciate value of human life as a great divine gift we believe that human life is a gift from God, and we appreciate that. Unfortunately, my time today is over, I, uh, and I have to uh, leave you. So inshallah, the uh, rest of the points about commonalities between Muslims and Christians, with an account of the way that Christians look at Islam, inshallah, will be uh, discussed in our next session.
وآخر دعوانا أن الحمد لله رب العالمين